Another one, uh, Tom Hardy, uh, who is a terrific young man, just a, a Roosevelt High School, and uh, he was National Player of the Year in 1997. We won our first national championship. He, um, he had a bad ankle, chronic problem, and we ended up having a meeting in our conference room, and it was Tom and his mother, uh, our team doctor, Dr. Joe Sam Sheldon, our trainer, Chet North, and myself. And we were discussing Tom's future, should he play. And he was willing to play with the pain that he was in. And it hit me in the middle of the meeting. You know, I was listening, and again, uh, but I was, the, was young. Tom obviously is younger than I am, but, but the mom and, and the doctor and, and our trainer were all much older. And I just realized as the conversation was going, Tom wanted to play, but we had to protect Tom from Tom. So I just said, hey, he's done. We're redshirting him this season. That's it. Uh, I feel like it would be wrong to play Tom at this point. I don't think, I think he's wanting to play and I think we got to protect him from himself. Everybody just said, you're right. So we redshirted him and, and the, the moral of that one is that he had an extra year. He was, we won the national championship. He was national player of the year. Got drafted into the pros, graduated. It's, uh, we won the national title on his birthday. It worked out okay by, uh, <laughs> by everybody's standards, you know. But, but the, you know, so I look, and, and you know what, you play hurt. I'm hurt. I got something wrong with my ankle right here, and I'm going to go running later, you know. I mean, that, you do play with cuts and bruises and nicks, and there's a time, you know. You know that you, you've probably heard, hey, if you're playing for a national championship today, would you play? Absolutely. You know, when we won the national title, Tom was icing his ankle literally every 20 minutes he was awake on and off because he got hit against Illinois and and so did we play him in that situation yeah but three years earlier it's not that the season wasn't significant enough it was that his ankle wasn't right you know and granted he was a little he was still hurt and 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 frankly he's got an ankle problem he's his ankle he, he, he dunked a basketball and the sole of his foot was facing up like this so I mean he's gonna have issues with it but the bottom line for me was that I realized there's a time to play a guy, and there's a time not to play a guy. And, and you have to make that decision. You have to listen, too. You have to listen. What are they saying? Because most of the time, athletes, they want to play. I, I broke nine bones. I broke my neck. I broke uh, my navicular bone. I, a lot of them. And I always wanted to play. You know? and that's the, isn't that amazing about athletics? You know? Because if I ever got hurt using a computer the way I got hurt playing soccer, I would never go near a computer the rest of my <laughs> life. You know that? But sports, it's like, when can I, I, I used to run with a, uh, the Philadelphia neck brace on because I wanted to get back on the field. I'll never forget the first time after a year wearing that brace, running in a stadium, and I've got the brace on from here to here, and I'm running <laughs> like this by myself, it, literally in the dark because uh, I snuck into the stadium, but that's another story. Uh, and, uh, but what about, isn't that interesting about athletics? They want to come back, so sometimes you have to protect them, you know. So that was valuable. And then the last example that uh, it, it's just the impact that, that I've learned that athletics can have. And this is a, in 1987, I played, uh, I went on a tour in England when I was a player, and we were sitting in a bar in England uh, with the team, and Tommy Jenkins, the head coach, was sitting right here, and I was sitting here, and I used to be a youth minister before I had this job. And uh, he said, there's no God. No God would let little kids, he was English, little kids die of diseases. And his son had just been diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. And that's an awful disease, trust me. It's terrible. It's your lungs uh, deteriorate and your body has a hard time um, uh, producing certain enzymes. And, and it's, it's, they call it terminal. We don't call it terminal with our program because we don't want to paint that picture for this young man. But... Um, so I knew Stevie through, th through his life, right? I knew him when he was two, and he's just a cute little kid, toe hair blonde and, and uh, uh, little blue horn rim glasses, and he could, man, he could play. When he was young, his health was good, and he could dribble through everybody and score, and dribble through everybody and score. <laughs> you know, it's great. I remember being at a game and watching Stevie beat everybody and score, beat everybody and score, and the coach saying, Stevie, pass the ball, and his dad, Tommy, and I were saying, no, no, no. He's scoring. It's okay. You know, let, let him go. But then as time went on, his health deteriorated. And uh, so I go to a game. You all right? Watch out. All right. Check the water. Uh,
<laughs> uh, so I go to a game, and uh, he's 17 or 18 years old. And I see his mom, and his mom and I were pals. And uh, I said, her name is BJ Jenkins. I said, BJ, how's Stevie doing? And she says, well, that's him sitting over there. And I, I hadn't seen him for five or six years. And kind of, I said, wow, how, how, how's his health? And he said, well, he can't play very much. He can do the warm-up. But he, he, and sometimes he gets in, but he can't do very much. And, and there was a little pack about the size of this, about this big. She says, see that little thing sitting next to him? I said, yeah. And she goes, he's feeding himself right now. There was, and I'm, I'm okay. I, it's legal for me to tell you this, by the way. We kept it undercover for a long time. I asked a couple years ago if we could tell this story. He's fine with it. It should be told. So there was a tube that went up under his shirt and into his stomach, and he has a little portal, and it gives him enough nutrients so that he can warm up. You know, that's how much that kid loves the game. So, so that's tough. He's a terrific young man. So I go back, and I'm talking to a buddy of mine, Brian Klein. I go, see that kid over there? And I give him the story, and a little more detail than I've given you. But, uh, and so he goes, hey, and, and he said, uh, I asked BJ, I said, where's he going to school? And he, she said, he's going to go to the UW. And I'm a Husky, okay, but, but I said, he's going to get lost. He's not going to know anybody, and it's a big school, and he might not get the support that he needs. He needs to be around a smaller group. And um, my buddy Brian Klein said he should play soccer for you at Seattle U. And I looked at him and thought, yeah, you're right. What the heck? Not a problem. So, so I called BJ and I told her that. I said, I really would like to see him playing for us at Seattle U. She said, well, we can't afford Seattle University. I said, well, we're a Catholic school. I'll go talk to the principal, uh, president and we'll get it worked out. He was a 3-8 student, 1280 SAT on the old scores. I mean, if I was had a terminal illness. I wouldn't be spending a lot of time in the classroom and I wouldn't have a 1280 or a 3.8. He's a great young man. So, so we went through the recruiting process. I said, Stevie, uh, I want you to come to Seattle U. I want you to be on the team. You, you, you have a spot. It needs to be known your situation because when we're doing the running and you're not, that's, it's important that, that uh, uh, players know why. And we're a family and we want to know everybody, if, if guys have difficulties, we want to be able to help each other. So I said, you think about it. And he called me back and said, yeah, I'd like to play. And I said, I'm going to ask the team now if they will let you on the squad. And, and I went to the team. It was a no-brainer. I knew it would happen. I said, okay, so when you come out on your visit, so we recruited him like we would anybody else, you know, uh, visit, official visit, uh, letters, phone calls, weekly, all that kind of stuff. So he comes out and plays for us. Played in three games his freshman year. You all, all of us in here can walk backwards faster than he can run because his lungs won't allow enough air into him to, to be able to run. Got great touch on the ball, good skill, excellent vision, loves the game, right? And so he plays in three games his freshman year. We all wear our nice sunglasses, and you look at the sunglasses, and there's everybody, you know, tears coming out of the sunglasses because we would, we would make sure he never wanted to compromise the success of the team. So he didn't want to go in unless we were up 4 nothing. So, and some days when we were, were up 4 nothing, he couldn't play because of his health. So anyway, uh, Bottom line is, you know, and he played in three games freshman year, two games his sophomore year. His junior year, which is the year we won the national championship a couple years ago, 2004, he practiced one day. And to come to practice, to, to come to training camp, he would do a blood transfusion for like three weeks. I think it was three weeks. I think it was like nine hours a day, three three-hour sessions. So he could be ready to practice. And uh, amazing story. I mean, it's, it really, and the first day he practiced with us, he had a good session for him. And everybody said, hey, you, you look good. He just new blood and all this. I went over to look at him, and his, he was laying on the ground. I thought he was going to die right there. His eyes were rolling. I was like, hey, you all right? He's going, yeah, I just got to catch my breath. That was the last day he played. And he's alive still. Um, and, and, uh, and he's waiting for a transplant. He had to withdraw from school. When he withdrew from school, he was a 3.5 GPA. <laughs> he went engineering his first year. And he tra transferred to uh, criminal justice. And he's got, I think, 110 credits right now, but he can't go to class. He's, he needs to sleep about 14 hours a day. But the education that Stevie Jenkins gave our players and me and our other coaches was phenomenal. And here we are. We were na national champions two years ago. There's a place for certain situations. Now, if Stevie didn't love the game, if he wasn't committed the way he was, it probably wouldn't be a good fit. You know what I mean? If it was... If it was a situation where we're going to bring you on and we'll have you around uh, really just in a sort of cutesy cute situation, you know, it's different. But this kid loved to play. This kid wanted to play. 
and uh, we just provided an opportunity for them. And it was beautiful when we win, you go in, you get your watch from the, after the game. Matt Potter, one of our assistant coaches, got his watch, and Stevie had to be a red shirt at that point. And they only give watches to the roster spots. Coach Potter grabs it, he's an alum, grabs the watch, turns, and he walks straight to Stevie, and he just goes, here, this is for you. You deserve this. Oh, kills you, you know, beautiful moment. So, so I think, you know, Sarah, you talked about vision in athletics, and, and I think there's a place for excellence in athletics. I think there's a place for bringing people together. My last day at Seattle U was, b frankly, beautiful in that, in that no one was in the office. They were up on campus, and, um, and I kind of snuck in and got all my stuff out because it's awkward leaving. And, uh, and, and we talk about you know, moral decisions, and, and I'll, I'll be kind of quick. The reason I left, and I don't want to make a big stink about it, was in the end I was not going to be able to rehire three assistant coaches. One who had been with me for 17 years uh, made $29,000 in, in 17 years. If he made two grand a year, he would have made 34, right? So he, he was a volunteer, and we had all-American goalkeepers, and we were going to move, shift our coaching staff philosophy, which I didn't want to shift. And, and so, and one guy who played four years, an alum, first in his family to graduate, and then he coached for 12 years. He made even less than <laughs> the goalie. Uh, he, we weren't going to be able to rehire him, and then we weren't going to be able to rehire another coach who had played for four and given a seven. And I finally said, you know what, I'm not doing it. Not on my watch. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to not hire these guys who have been so good. So, so um, 